Hello class, it's Dr. Lee Fortier here, taking you through Bible study methods, how to interpret the Bible, understand the Bible, and, and really apply it to your life better throughout the rest of your journey. Over the last four weeks, we've done a deep dive into understanding how to interpret the Bible and the structure of the Bible. And as we enter into week five, our final week, we're going to do a deep dive into the idea of biblical word studies. And so I want to share just five things today that I think will help you. And we'll unpack two of those things in a, in a fairly uh, practical way. One, one will be a little bit more theoretical, but in a practical way that will give you some tools and some insights into how to do those biblical word studies. And if you remember all the way back to week one, we actually touched on word studies just a little bit and a little bit along the way, but this is our week to do a deep dive into biblical word studies. Now, I want to just say one thing before we dive in, and this sounds like uh, I'm saying, hey, it's not important, which is not the case, but I want you to understand something that's very important. A lot of students, when they're beginning to look at the Bible in a an intentional way. In other words, not just casually reading through it like you would a novel, nor are they just like looking at a verse here or there every other day. But, but students who pick up the Bible and say, I really want to know this book. I want to know what God has said, and I want to understand it in the clearest way possible. Many of those students will use some, some tools that will help them dig deep into the biblical words. But if you're one of those students out there, and maybe you'll say, I'm never going to take more than two years of Greek or one year. Of, I'm just not going to take all the Greek and Hebrew stuff. I just really want to understand the English Bible. There's nothing wrong with that. That's fantastic. But I would just say, if I could give you a word of advice, rather than trying to drill really deep down on words, and I see students spend a lot of time trying to do this, without the tools or the expertise on doing that, at the expense, they do that drilling down, at the expense of really getting the big picture of the Bible. If we were sitting down right now and maybe you're you know, 25 years old and you're just beginning this journey and you're saying, hey, I want to understand the Bible better. Should I just start doing word studies? I, I would say no. I would say that's not the place to start. That's a, that's a good thing to do, but it's maybe not the place to start. I would say if you're finding a place to start, begin with the New Testament. And, and read and understand the actual Bible of the New Testament. And then after you kind of get a handle on that, do the entire Bible. And the, the Old Testament will begin to come to life better, I think, if you start with the New Testament. But you really won't be able to understand the New Testament really accurately or fully if you don't have that foundation of the Old Testament. But reading the New Testament first does kind of unlock. It's kind of like reading the, the back of the mystery novel first and saying, oh, the butler did it. And then as you read through the novel, although it's been spoiled, um, as you read through the mystery novel, you're, you're kind of looking for what? Oh, I'm looking for the clues that the butler did it. And, and although you may not like reading books that way, if you're trying to study something academically, knowing what you're supposed to be looking for is a great way to identify the clues. It may not be as enjoyable on the journey, but it's enriching in its purpose. And so I would say really spend some time reading the entire Bible. I don't know what percentage of really active Christians have never read the Bible, but I bet it would surprise us. I was actually talking to a pastor recently, and I just said, you know, I've wondered how many pastors, uh, I hope you're sitting down, but how many pastors have never read the entire Bible once? Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh man, you know, every, every pastor has got to read the Bible at least 25 times before they preach any sermons. But I would say to you, just a sneaking suspicion, I bet you 25% of the pastors out there have never read the entire Bible cover to cover. People who are up teaching and preaching and those kind of things may have never read the entire Bible. And I would just say, until you've read the entire, if you've not read the entire Bible and you want to start drilling down in one little word, I would just say, savor the big picture 
and then begin to look at, hey, how do I drill down on those words? So I'm just kind of giving you kind of this picture. If you're new to the Bible, uh, maybe the best place to start is not by saying, I'm going to do a word study on every word in the New Testament. Maybe just reading the New Testament is a better place to start. Now that I don't believe in word studies, but hey, I, I want you to really understand the Bible and understanding that context. So here's five things about word studies that I think could help you tremendously. These are the things I would say to you as someone who's read the Bible many times and who has um, mentored a lot of people, taught the Bible for decades. The Bible is my life. So number one, if you're taking notes, remember that words have usages more than they have meanings. Remember, we touched on that a few weeks ago. Sometimes we think a word has a meaning, and it, it sort of does. But in reality, words have usages, so they may not always play out the way you think they should. So just hold that, not only with the Bible, but with life. Words have usages. Number two, use multiple translations to identify variances in the text. In other words, well, how do you understand what words you should do a word study on? Have you ever thought about it? I mean, do you just like you know, open the Bible and in the beginning, Hebrew word Barashit, uh, in, I'm going to do a Bible study or deep dive on the word in, I'm going to do one on the word the, I'm going to do, you know, how do you know which words to really begin to investigate that are going to make your time investment the most valuable? And I would say use several really good English translations. I'm going to show you an example of this and how it plays out in just a minute. But use several good English translations. And as you're reading them, you may realize, well, wait a minute. This Bible translation says this, and this one is saying this. What you may have there is a word that is not easily defined. So, for example... We kind of talked about this in week one. The word tree is pretty easy to define. You know, there is a tree. But in the English language, yeah, a tree works pretty good. But what about fruit? Is a tomato a fruit? And that's where the whole world just gets crazy. You know, tomatoes are vegetables or a fruit. Well, they're a fruit. Uh, they look like a vegetable, um, but they're really a fruit. Well, how do you know? And, and the thing is, is we, we use words in different ways. And it's the same way with the Bible and all of life. And so by comparing English translations, you can begin to understand something snarky is going on here at this word. Why, why are they using different words here? That could be a clue. That's a place to try to figure out why they use different words. It could be a rich spot to begin to drill down. So don't just begin to go out into a field and drill holes everywhere. Try to figure out where is it going to be some pay dirt. Where can I really make use of my time? And like I said, I'll, I'll show you some of that. Number three, remember that Webster is twice removed. I, I hear a lot of people teaching the Bible do this, and it, it's, it's somewhat helpful if, you know, you're in the third grade, but I mean, if you're dealing with people where you're really kind of teaching the Bible on a serious level, it's almost pointless. And so somebody will say, you know, I opened up the Bible, and I read this word, and it said, you know, um, it has not overtaken. So you look up the word overtaken, or you look up the word comprehend, or something like that in the Bible. And in the, you know, you see it in the Bible, the word comprehend. So you go to the English dictionary, and you go, this is how it defines the word comprehend. Now, that's helpful, especially if you're maybe new to the English language, or you don't know what words um the word particular word means. Uh, sometimes if you're using the King James, there's words in the King James that you come across and you're like, what does that mean? Like you may see, you know, do you wit? And and you may wit, I, I may wit, somebody else may wit, but do we know what wit means? If, if we wit, is that good or bad? I mean, if I say, do you wit? How would you answer me? Well, there's this little gnat flying around here. Sorry about that. Um, but I mean, if she said, do you wit? Well, we don't really use the word wit uh, in the English language anymore, but it means like understand. And you get like, you scared the wits out of you, right? You know, the, it's your consciousness, your understanding. And so the King James will use that word sometimes for understanding. 
and you may say, ooh, I, I didn't realize that. Or you may read a word like in the King James, and the King James was written or translated from uh, earlier English translations and checked with the Greek and Hebrew uh, in 1611. And like we said before, it's been updated several times, and it was recently updated in 1769, but it's still, some of the word usage is very different. So when you come to a word in the King James, you say, I, I just don't know what this word means, or I don't really you know, I'm not sure I'm tracking with how they're using this word. Um, looking it up like in a dictionary, like Webster, could be very helpful. Let me give you an example about this. of this. The King James says, um, you know, that what we ought to do is our conversations should be a certain way. And when you and I hear the word conversations, what do we think of? Well, it's when we talk to somebody, that's a conversation. And if we jump to that conclusion, that's where maybe going, and I know I said don't go to Webster, but I'm showing you how it can be helpful. Webster could be helpful because the word conversation, the way the King James was using it, wasn't your speech. It was your lifestyle. Your lifestyle is your conversation. And you're like, oh, it, the word has just changed. And so going to Webster and going, well, you know, in 1769, how was this word used? And figuring out how the word, the English word was used maybe several hundred years ago, can you can begin to translate it into how it could be used today. And so if you're using the King James, sometimes Webster can be very helpful because you may come across words that just aren't used either at all in the English language today. They're used extremely little in the English language or uh, their, their usage has changed in the English language. And so kind of pinning down you know, they used this word several hundred years ago. What are some of the ways that that word, would, and it's not easily researched, but figuring that out. When people pick up a, a, a modern translation of the Bible and they say, you know, Jesus saw Nicodemus in a tree, and you're thinking, what is a tree? And you may not know what a tree is if you're not an English speaker. So you look it up in Webster's Dictionary, and oh, that's what a tree is. But if you look up the word tree there, you're looking up an English word that represents a Greek word. And so it's twice removed. So in other words, there was a Greek word or Hebrew word that was put into an English word at, by a translator at some time. Um, and then you're looking back and you're saying, okay, what does this dictionary over here say about this word? But you see, that's twice removed. And that's where an English lexicon or dictionary it only gets you one step but if you had a greek or hebrew dictionary you you go right over that middle step and you go all the way back to the beginning and you're able to say well how is this word used now when you begin to look at english words in your translations you may look up a word and say okay here's the word that english word will go back to if we will a greek word but this Greek word may go into several English words, which you may not realize it's represented in different places. And the English word, right, it may, you may have the same English word, you may have four or five different English words here that go back to different Greek words. It's a different word altogether. And so you go, oh yeah. And so it gets a little complicated. I'm gonna show you in just a minute some of what I'm talking about so that it kind of will make more sense. Um, and so number four, if you're taking notes, use tools to do a word study. Now, one thing that you have available um, at the, the hand's length on your computer is you have um, Bible applications, Bible software, websites and things that are designed to make this much, much, much easier where you can kind of begin to connect the dots. I remember being a first year Greek student way back, or maybe second year Greek student, I don't know, a long time ago. Um, but I remember I came across a Greek word in the Greek New Testament, and we were translating it for homework, and I couldn't figure it out because I didn't know what the Greek root was. So I couldn't look it up in the dictionary. And I remember there were times in that particular time, two or three hours trying to figure out what is that word? 
What's amazing now is there's software where you can right click it and it gives you the lexical form, the one that's found in the dictionary that fast. Um, I could have saved three hours of my homework that night and I could have done it in 15 seconds. Um, we didn't have that when we were coming through, but you are privy to a lot of tools that the generations before you did not have available. And so I want to show you, as far as using tools, um, in just a few minutes, I want to show you um, one of the tools that your textbook mentioned. And honestly, I, I never really looked at it until this week, getting ready yesterday, preparing for this lesson, actually several days ago, but looking at it, preparing for this lesson. I, people, I've heard people talk about it. I've looked at it for like 30 seconds. I don't use that because I, I'm privileged to have paid things that work better. Um, but, but what I found is it's really good and I tried to figure it out so I could show you how to use this free tool in, a, in an academic way to begin to drill down to make the most of it. And the last thing I want to do is I want to talk to you about staying on target. I've got a little graph I want to show you there. So if you were taking notes, remember words have usages and not meanings. Number two, use multiple translations of the Bible to identify variances, changes, uh, things that are different. Uh, number three, remember that Webster is twice removed. Number four, use tools. And number five, stay on track. Now what I'm going to do here, class, is I am going to switch to my desktop right here so that I can show you some things. And I want to take you kind of on a little journey here. Um, I'm going to switch to the desktop and I'm going to open um, something for you. Find it, the Blue Letter Bible. It is the translation of the Bible that held its breath for too long. And so as we go to the, the Blue Letter Bible, I want to just open this up and show you this. There we go. So you should be able to see that on your screen. I'm going to make it extra big because I know that um, you may be looking on a small device or whatever. And just kind of wanted to show you how this works. So your, your textbook actually drove you to the site. And if you notice, whoa, what did I do there? Um, we have some... So you notice here, back to this, that we have different translations that we can choose from. So we're going to start off with the old King Jimmy, and um, we see that we can retrieve different verses. So we're just going to use old simple John chapter 1, and we're going to retrieve it. And so there you go. You have a free version of the Bible. And if you look at this, the Blue Letter Bible people are actually wonderful because some of these are modern translations, um, and so they're still under copyright. And that means the translation people have spent a fortune translating them so they sell that to make up for it and eventually it becomes public domain so things like the king james is public domain now because the last update was 1769 and so you anybody can get that for free the new king james on here is actually one that's still under copyright and actually quite hard to get your hands on one of the most difficult ones i found um, if you're trying to publish they they're they're really restrictive on that. But you have other translations and they give you a nice little free splattering here of um, some of these translations. And you even have some, some Greek type things over here. Um, the Old Testament in Greek, um, you have the Texas Receptus, which is uh, the late manuscripts that are found actually, for the most part in the King James. Um, this, the, one, the newer Greek manuscripts are found in this older English translation. And so you can pick this. And so you can actually go to this and you say, well, how, how do I do a word study? Well, you got several things. You can look up a word. And so I want to look up the word dog in the Bible. So that's a cool word. And so here's some stuff is that you get a dictionary here and, uh, you know, dog. The word dog means dog. And so got it. Uh, if you look at for, you know, a lexicon over here, you have... Um, some of the Hebrew and Greek words, you, oh, make it smaller again for you, uh, that kind of show you what these words are. They give you a transliteration. They show you the Hebrew, they show you the Greek transliteration and the English equivalent. So we're picking something that's really simple. And then the, this is kind of cool is, you know, some facts um, about that particular word. But we'll go back to the primary. And if you look at this, the word dog in the King James Bible occurs 15 times. And so that's pretty cool. So yeah, I know that that's where it is. And if you were, this is where this kind of tool can become 
very, very helpful. It's a concordance. Now, back in the day, I had a concordance that was like this big, a Strong's Concordance, when I was about 14 years old. And it was really great because you'd remember a verse in the Bible, right? But you could only remember a little bit of it, like, um, delight yourself in the Lord. And you're like, where is that in the Bible? And you just have no clue. And you pick up the most obscure word and put in delight. And you could look up the word delight and it would list every delight. And you would just look through all the lights. So you would try to find the most obscure word because you don't want to be like the, because you'd be a lot of those. But um, the word, you know, delight, there wouldn't be that many occurrences. And you could look at it and it would usually take the word, the first letter of the word you were looking up. So it would say delight. And then it would have the word D in the text because you know what that one is. And you would be able to go through until you kind of found the one that you were looking for and you could find out where it was. It was a wonderful thing. That was before we were able to take a phone and say, you know, look up the word delight and just search the Bible for me and, and that kind of thing. We didn't have that. You have that. I have that. It's a magical thing. It's just wonderful. And so we can look up these words. So this is a concordance. Any of these electronic Bibles that are searchable replace the big green monster. Um, and you're able to just kind of go through it. You can make the letters bigger. You can change from translation to translation. So sometimes you'll remember um, a certain verse was in your head. And you'll, you'll look it up like maybe in the King James, but you read it in the NIV, it may be a different word and you can't find it. And so you have to try to remember, well, not every word is the same in every translation, but every one of those translations is searchable by this kind of a database. And so kind of going a step further, if we look at this, there was a place over here where you could kind of look at this with Strong's and see right here, you should be able to see it on the screen. I, I want to do Strong's. And now what's interesting about this is that Strong's has put the word dog for us. And what they've done is they put it with a, a letter and the, you have the H letter, I believe that stands for Hebrew. Um, and then this is a Strong's number. So the Strong guy, what he did, um, there was Young's and Strong's and is he numbered all of these Greek primary words. So let's put in the word love. We'll get one that's gonna occur a lot of times in the, in the Bible. And so there's the word love. It occurs 310 times in 280 verses. And here we see them over and over again. We can hit the old Strong's up here. And uh, there it is. We find that there's a, a basically he doesn't do the, the, the ands, the conjunctions and the, the, the um, um, probably a lot of the prepositions, like in the New Testament, I know you, your textbook said they're really important, but in the New Testament times, prepositions were actually beginning to, to weaken and fade a little bit um, in the Greek New Testament, not so much in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, it's a little bit of a different story there too. But we find that with the major words, um, we'll have a, um, a Hebrew um, number put to them. And like in Hebrew, uh, the, the conjunction there isn't a separate word. It's just tacked on the front of the word, but that's okay. Um, so you could look up any of these words uh, by their particular link. And so we could probably, I guess that goes this way, and we can say, okay, and there's this cow, the fowl, pa'il, pu'al, and if you know Hebrew, that will mean something to you. But, but we see the Hebrew word, um, uh, uh have. And so there it is. So you've got it. But if you look over here, this is kind of neat. You get a search results. This is how many times this particular word, oops, I didn't mean to do that. This particular word occurs in each book of the Bible. So this word occurs uh, two, three times in Genesis two times in Exodus, and then it also does this, which is pretty cool. And you begin to see, and this is where the high frequency could probably pay off, is you begin to see the different translations of the Bible. How many times do they mention that? And that's going to drive me crazy. How many times do they mention the word love? And so it looks like one of the lower ones here just happens to be uh, the Young's Living Translation, although King James is pretty low. But we also find that the... Um, the CSV and the ESV are really high. NIV, uh, New Living Translation, is really high, almost double that amount. And you can do a word study to begin to figure out, well, why would different ones be translated different ways? And so with this Hebrew term here, you were able to do that. But let's go ahead and go down to the New Testament and maybe get a look here. Um, let me 
make sure I'm doing this correctly. King James. Um, there's some advanced options. Interesting. Oh, you could do from book to book. That's interesting. Didn't know that. Um, but we should have the word love. And it should go from Genesis to Revolutions. To Revelations, of course. And we're not getting all the way there. And the word of love appears more. And so why is it that I have to go to a different page? Maybe by clicking this, perhaps. Um, yep, you're kind of learning with me here. Um, so we know that love occurs in the New Testament. Search results continued. Duh, we got it. Um, so let's just jump in here and we'll jump to number three. It was right in front. I just have never used this program very much. So I'm learning it with you, but I'm going to show you how to leverage it. And so here we're going to get to the New Testament's usage of love. And so there we go. And so we can jump in there. And interesting with the King James, uh, if you love God right here. And so we can come up here and hit our Strong's button. And there we go. We now will have probably a Greek. Yep. And it's a, it's a, um, it's a, a G26. And so we'll just click on that just to see. And this is the noun agape. Um, you probably have seen that word before. Agapa O is the verb. Um, agapatos is the adjective. So like beloved would be agapatos. Uh, love, you know, like as a noun uh, thing is, uh, you know, agape, and if I were to say I love, it'd be agapo or agapo, um, <clears throat> agapo, agapo in writing, agapo in the dictionary. Um, and so you see these different places that this is found, and of course, this is a Greek word, so it's only in the New Testament, unless we were to open up the LXX, which stands for the Greek Bible in the Old Testament. It's called the Septuagint, and that's the Roman letters for 70, because the idea is that 72 Jewish scholars translated the Greek, the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek because so many people in the ancient world prior to Christ um, had been Hellenized. They had been taught Greek. It was the street language before Jesus. And so, so many Jews outside of Israel proper no longer spoke Hebrew or Aramaic. And so the Bible was put into the LXX. What we know as the LXX is the Septuagint. And that was, we showed you the LXX translation on there. Interestingly enough, as we look at this, we see different noun forms here. Um, shows you what they are. So that's really good. So accusative. Um, and so that's like a direct object. Um, if you look at this one over here, we have a plural dative uh, feminine. And so you have something that would be like to love. Um, it's the idea, dative, uh, different cases in the Greek New Testament. You notice in the Texas Receptus, uh, you have this many times, this many in the Septuagint. There it is right there. We have 15 times. So I guess if we click on that, we can see the 15 usages in the Texas Receptus, um, which is a, a very, um, it's, it's probably the weakest translate or Greek Bible you're going to be able to use. Down at the bottom, we have Thayer's kind of a, out of uh, a, a very old um, Greek dictionary lexicon that can kind of give you a little bit of idea about that. And you can actually show off. So you can, you can dig in there. And so how to use it? Well, what you could do is how to use it is begin to look at those words that maybe don't match. And I'm going to take you into my Bible program, the one I use that I'm a little bit more familiar with, that I use every day and have for a decade or more, and, and be able to kind of show you some things that you could do here. Uh, but doing it here would be a little bit more labor intensive. And um, I think I'm going to be able to show you more with the other. And so even though it's not a one-to-one, -one, you can get the theory of what you would look for by looking at this other Bible thing. And you could look at it here by opening up many English translations and saying, okay, I want to compare them. And I believe you can up here somewhere compare them. You can make red letter. Um, the Bible didn't originally have red letters for the name, for the words of Jesus. And that's what that means is that modern translators have put it in red. Red is hard, actually hard to see. Some people have thought it's because of the blood of Christ. It isn't. It's just to, to set apart what the words of Jesus are. And sometimes that's an interpretation. It's hard to know when the Bible, 
author, if you will, stops talking and Jesus starts where those quotes are. It's not always as easy as you think. Most times it's pretty easy, but not always. And so here you go. That's kind of an introduction on how to do a word study. So if you were to go to, let, let me take you just a little bit further here. Um, if we were to go to, um, I wrote down a couple of scriptures to kind of show you just to keep it on my head. Uh, John chapter 1, verse 5. We're going to notice something kind of unusual here in John chapter 1. Okay, John chapter 1. Nope. John, let's try that one more time. John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Verse 5. I have my fingers on the wrong keys. The light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness has comprehended it not. Well, if we were to look at that in a different translation, we might find a different way to translate it. So let's just take a look at that. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Let's go back and look at that again. Overcome. Pay attention to that word. Comprehend. That's a different word. So if you were to look up the word comprehend in the in the Webster's Dictionary or the word overcome in the English Dictionary, you would kind of have two different ideas. So this is an example of where reading different English translations um, can tip you off. Something's going on there. Something, why would they translate that so differently? Um, and one of the possibilities, which is not the case here, is that perhaps the Texas Receptus would have had uh, a newer edition uh, that could have been put in there, a different word that was added, or perhaps a misspelling, uh, or maybe it was a, you know, a misspelling in an earlier document that was picked up, but probably in the latter would be most likely. Um, you know, is it that there's different Greek words behind this? Or did they translate it different? And the tip here is they translated it differently. And I'm going to show you that in just a minute. So let's go ahead and, and leave the Blue Letter Bible. <clears throat> uh, before we do, one more thing is what you would do is you could use this to find everywhere your word, uh, uh, sorry about the uppercase, I'm not shouting, comprehend occurs. And so here we find the word comprehend in the King James Bible occurs two times. So if you're doing a, a word study, you could say, okay, I'm going to find the word comprehend. I know I said I was going to go to the other, but I just want to show you this right here. Comprehend. Okay, so this word only occurs two times in the English Bible named the King James. But here what we want to do is let's go ahead and go to our Strong's. Okay, so we would click on this uh, particular word. Let's go to a New Testament comprehend. How come we didn't have, maybe we had to do comprehended. Um, yes, it's case it's sensitive to that. So when we put in the word comprehended, um, we could probably put in the, this is kind of a cheat, probably this works in a lot of Bible programs, comprehended with a little star, we'll find every variance of it, but it looks like it did not. We're all running together. Isn't this fun? Comprehend, comprehended. Okay, so it did pick up all five and you put the star. And so here it is, comprehended it not. Now watch what happens when we click on Strong's here. We would expect to click on this magic button. And how many New Testament comprehended do you think you would find? Two or three? Two, right? How many times does this word appear? What? Even in the Texas Receptus, it's 15 times. Wow, this is a fairly common word. It occurs once in Mark, four times in John, uh, in this form, other uh, variants of it all over the place. Acts one three, what, you know, whoa, why is it all of this? Well, let's go ahead and do a deeper dive in something I use every day that I think will be a lot of fun for you, and we'll go ahead and break this down. Um, and this is there's two really great Bible softwares that I would recommend if you were like, hey, I'm gonna really study the Bible for the rest of my life, and I want to go ahead and get a Bible software, I would really highly recommend one of two. Uh, they are the McDonald's and Burger King of Bible softwares, and one is called Logos, like the Greek word Logos. Some people say Logos. Um, 
if you say the Greek way, it's logos. Uh, the other one, which is what you see here, is called accordance, like concordance, but without the C. Um, C O N. Uh, it's called accordance. And I've got it set up to actually just show you what we were talking about. So looking at this text here, um, what you see, and I can move this around, is that in the New American Standard Bible version of 1995, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So we see the word comprehend, and notice that it's kind of highlighting for us so cool, so easy. So even if you were not an expert Greek student, but you were like, hey, I'm really interested in doing these things, do you notice how it's blue in all three? So it shows you, ah, katalaven is the Greek word. So then you can find it, because if you're not a Greek student, sometimes finding, you know, what word goes with which one can be a little bit of a challenge. And so we see comprehend and overcome. And as we look at the new, the Nestle, the Nestle Alant 28, which is a, uh, a Greek New Testament, um, we see that it highlights this one word. Um, so, okay, it's going back to one word. Now, what we could do is we could open up the Texas Receptus here and see, does the Texas Receptus have a different Greek word? I don't even know if I have the Texas Receptus. I don't use it that often. I probably do. I don't know. It's a free one, so it's probably in there. Um, I don't know if I have that. It could also be the New Testament according to the majority text. Um, sometimes you'll see it abbreviated with a capital M, uh, majority text. And so here we have. So there you go. How cool is that? And so you look at it, it's katalab, and it's the same word. We see it right here. Um, so it's not a different word. So the the very modern new Texas Receptus and the ancient Greek manuscripts all have the same word. But when I look at the English translation, the New American Standard, 1995, the ESV, and as you saw, the King James falls in line with one of those, and uh, it's really different. So what's going on? And so here's what we could say, let's do a Bible study. So we could get Webster out and we could try to dig down really deep on what does the word comprehend mean? right? Or we can try to dig down and say, what does the word overcome mean? And try to resolve why they're translating this two different ways. And the truth of the matter is that endeavor would not be that fruitful. I mean, you could quote Webster, you could read everything Webster said on both of those words, and it's probably not going to get you where you need to be. Now, what's interesting is that just like we talked about butterfly a few weeks ago, this is a word with the etymology, the, the, the parts really do paint a picture, and it was used more than one way in the ancient world. So sometimes in the ancient world, in the Bible, it can be used one way, and sometimes it can be used another way, and it's really a coin toss on which one it is. And you say, well, how can that word right there that I see, katalaban, how can that be such different things. Well, let's take a look at that and we'll discover that together. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open this up in a Greek dictionary. Um, so we'll do that right now. And so we have that over here on the side. Let me get rid of that. And so what we have is we have the word lumbano in the little kittle. And so let me find a, a, an easier one maybe for you to kind of get a handle on. And so what we have here is we have the compound word and we, it shows us in the Greek dictionary, that it's kata lumbano. Um, and so kata is a preposition, and it can mean different things depending on the case that it's accompanying. Uh, but it, one of the simple usages of the word kata, which you don't have in this definition here, um, is down. But what you do have is you have the definition of the word um, lumbano. And the word lumbano right here, or I guess you do have kata lumbano now that I'm looking at it. Yes, you do. Is um, lumbano means to receive. So if I had a baseball and I threw it to you, I would say, you know, you, oh, you're, you know, football, you're the receiver, <laughs> you know, but receive it. You're, lumbano is a verb. Receive it. Kata lumbano means to receive down. So if I'm thinking about a math problem, I can receive, I got it, I took it down, I, I understand it, I brought it down in my mind, I got it down, comprehend. But they can also mean, go back to the football illustration, throw the football to somebody, what can you do? You can receive them down, you can tackle them. And so it can mean receive down mentally or receive down 
physically. And hence the issue. Is it that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not understand it? Or is it that the, dark, the light has shined in the darkness and the darkness could not overcome it? And the answer to that question, probably the best translation is yes. It probably is that, that Jesus, John, is using, uh, Jesus is using this to communicate to us something that does have a double picture. Um, but your English translations are forced to pick one. So if you were to look at Catalambano, you could look at this. And we found out recently, and I don't think I have it. I have Thayer in here, and that's the free one. So let's just see what he has on Catalambano. And so if we look at Catalambano, um, we could look up Lombano, and we could look up Cato, but we could look up Cato Lombano. And so as we look at this, we could do the word study right here. Remember how this was available to you in the Blue Letter Bible. And you would look at this and say, oh, to lay a hold of as to make one's own. So to, to embrace, to seize upon, to take possession, to overtake, to detect, to catch, to lay hold of with the mind. And so you begin to go, oh, do you see how all of that's working? And so, okay, so now we have a little bit of an idea of how that Greek word katalambano functions. But now what we can do is we can say, I can look up everywhere comprehend appears in the, and we would want to say the New Testament because the Hebrew Old, Bi Old Testament Bible wouldn't have the word katalabano. Katalambano is the dictionary form. But we could look in the Septuagint. That would be a different study. And I would just say at this point, just stick with the New Testament. But we could look this one up. And so we could look up that word. And that's how you would look it up by your Strong's number before. Because what Strong would do is it would show you all the places that Cata Lombano appeared. So we can do that here. And this is kind of fun because what we can do is we can copy that word. We can come up here and say, okay, right now we're in this one. Let's go to the United Bible Society, 4th edition, Greek New Testament. And let's put in our word. We're going to go to verses to words. There it is. And we're going to look it up. And if we look it up, we know that, okay, wait a minute. Uh, we got to find the dictionary form. So it's changed. And Greek is uh, a, a language that's highly inflected. So the words change spelling to show a different use. English does that, not to the extent that Greek does, but English does. Let me give you an example. I see the man. If you look up the word see in the English Bible, S-E-E, -E, it would be like, well, it's something you behold with your eyes. But what about the past tense of the word see? I saw a man. If the word saw was not in your English dictionary, you would have to know that see is just the, the, the present tense of saw. And so you're going to have to look up see to figure out saw. That's where it gets a little confusing. And so as a, if you're not an English speaker, you look at that and go, why not just say I seed? <laughs> right? Wouldn't that be more easy than saying I saw, I see, I am seeing? I seed, <laughs> put seeds in the ground. Um, but wouldn't that be easier to say seed because then it, it would follow the same rule. And you say it just becomes saw and you probably never thought about it because you know that saw is the past tense of see. But we would have to look up in here the word catalambano. And so we use a little look it up. Um, catalambano. Uh, here it is. And so we see to overtake, to take, to receive down. And so when we hit this, ah, something magical happens. We're going to look it up. So just like before in the other translation, and you can actually get a, a free version of this Accordance Bible software if you want to play with it. Um, it won't have all of these resources, but you can buy particular ones that interest you and build on that. And so we looked it up in the UBS4. And so what we find is that this word, katalambano, occurs 15 times. And so unlike the fact that the, um, you know, comprehend or whatever occurred two or three times, we find that it occurs a lot more. And we can actually begin to look at an analysis of that word, um, of how, you know, how it's being used. And we can probably, have, let's not go there, um, but we can see that it's used 15 times. And as we look at that, we can say, wow, this is the range. It's the New Testament. It's used 15 times. I would like to see where it's used. And so as I do an analysis of this, I want to not only see the word, but I want to see where it's used. And so let me see if I can find, I'm looking at, uh, looking at it well, it's sideways here. Here's your concordance. So there's a list of all the places that it's used. And if you wanted to say, hey, I want to know how it's used. 
give me an idea of how this word is used in the different forms in the New Testament. You could do a bar graph of that and say, okay, this is 15 uses of Catalambano in the lexical form. That means the dictionary form. Uh, inflected means the different forms that it appears in. And so that you see here, these are the different forms. And we can do the same thing and say, hey, I want to know what books of the Bible, that particular word, kind of doing a graph on that, you could do that too. And so what we can begin to do is look at the word Catalambano here, and you see it in different forms throughout this opportunity. Now, if you were using this and you, you don't really know Greek, but you know this is the word, when you hover over it, notice how your English translation becomes blue. So you can say, okay, there's where it is in this one. So if we, let's get rid of the Texas Recipitus. Um, if we were to open up, let's just say the, let's see, that's one we might want to say. Let's just do ESV. Okay, now we go back to Katalaban, and there we see it's overcome, overcome, and we would be able to do a comparison of those and look at how is that word used. So I want to do one more thing with you that's just kind of fun that will take you probably deeper than you're going to get on an average Sunday morning in church and maybe even in your Sunday school class, but that could be a lot of fun and um, kind of show you how different words are used sometimes. But let's go to John chapter 15, uh, John chapter 12, John 12, I think 7. Yes, and so here we have this, this interesting uh, occurrence where Jesus is near, he's beginning his last week, it's the weekend before he's going to die, and Jesus is anointed with Mary, and she breaks out this really expensive nard perfume type stuff, and she begins to anoint his feet, anoint his body, and there was a, an episode where Judas uh, looks at this and goes, this is really expensive. And, and here she is. She's in this moment of worship, okay? And he's like, she's got it all wrong. And you can almost picture how she must have felt at that moment. Here she is. She's giving this worship to Jesus. And while she's worshiping an apostle, not just a you know, passerby, one of the official disciples of Jesus a powerful man, the treasurer of the church, keeper of the money bag, says, this is a waste. What is she doing? And as we look at this, let's look at the ESV real quick, just for fun. Jesus said to Judas and the other disciples standing with him, leave her alone. So if we were to look at that, we would say, well, leave her alone. What's the word there for leave her alone? Um, and the reality is it's really kind of an unusual word. It's not what you think. He's just not saying hey, yeah, uh, chill out. Um, he, Jesus said something very powerful to her. So let's see if we can do a little analysis. And so when we hover over the word leave, you say, well, nothing occurs. Well, uh, the, the word leave her alone uh, is, is one word. So maybe if we hover over her, and there's the word her, and they've attained. And so we see her, and when we go over alone, you would expect something like mas, like uh, alone, like single, but it's not. And notice this Greek word right here. And you say, oh, that must be the word for leave her alone. And so you would expect um, something like um, back off or just stop or something like that. But this is a common word in the Greek New Testament. And it's used a couple of different ways. And one of the ways that it's used uh, is going to surprise you. And so let's look at it. So we're going to open it. Let's see if we can just open it up by double-clicking on it and see if we can get that open. And um, it is going to surprise you. A word that means to send away from. It means to separate. And so, interestingly enough, this particular word in the New Testament is the common word for forgive. And so, but it also means to just back off. And so if you were to look up this word in the Greek New Testament, what you would find is that it not only means back off, it also means forgive. And so remember how we talked about uh, words have usages. And so this little word right here, a face, uh, is a form of forgive. And so he's, staying, he's stating it in a very strong way. Back off, forgive, separate, leave. 
get away from her. And so when Jesus said that, if you can follow the little, the little mouse here, uh, what we find is that's a direct object. Forgive her. Get away from her. You know what's interesting is that when we deal with sin in the Bible, sin with a feami, in other words, when sin is forgiven, sin is forgiven, but people are not. What? When you look in the Greek New Testament, what you find is this word forgive, when it's linked to the idea of sin, does not take an accusative direct object, forgive that person, as a, as a person the direct object. It takes sin as the direct object. Sins are forgiven in the Bible. People are not. I know I'm blowing your mind. And so remember on the cross, what did Jesus say? Forgive them. They know not what they do. We're going to look that up here in a minute. I'll show it to you. It'll be a lot of fun. I wouldn't plan on doing this. Um, and honestly, I can't remember where it's found, where the, the scripture reference for that. So we're going to actually use this as a um, forgive them. They know not. So we're going to have to put that in because that's copying. Forgive. i got to stop doing capital letters. Forgive them. Let's just see what happens. Oh, got to close the quotes. Forgive them. They know not what they do. Remember when Jesus said that? Oh, let's look up the Johannine one right here. You know, it's going to be, let's, let's take a look at that. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them. See that word? It's the same word. Do you see that? It comes from a family. It's the same word. A face, a choice. And instead of being the feminine, um, which was, an, was the direct object, forgive them her, get away from her, here it's an indirect object. It's a different spelling. Jesus didn't say forgive them. He said forgive to them. What? Forgive to them. Um, and so this is a different spelling. And so what, what does this mean? It's implied. This is Luke. I thought we were in John. Let's go up to John. Um, and Jesus said, let's just see, um, Forgive the sins. Forgive the sins. And so their sins is being forgiven. But, okay, I see why it's taking me there. Father, forgive them. And so here you would say, well, people are being forgiven. Sins are being forgiven. What is Jesus saying is forgive to them. You can't have an indirect object in English without a direct object. Their sins, they know not what they're doing. And you say, well, why is that important? It's important because in the Bible, God forgives sins by taking them away and removing them as far as the east is from the west. And so when people say, Jesus, I'm giving you my life, God takes the sin and removes it. So the sins are forgiven, sent away, but the people are not. The, those who repent are received does that make sense? It's almost the exact opposite. And so if we look at this Greek dictionary, and we have Kittle opened here, and that, that's a decent one. Um, let's see if I could, was going to open a different one for you. But you can see how a good Greek dictionary, as opposed to forgive, if you looked up forgive in like Webster's, it would probably say to let somebody off the hook, right? And so if I... I'm walking past you and I bump into you and spill my Diet Coke on you. I don't really drink a lot of Diet Coke, but if I spilled it on you, I'd say, oh, please forgive me. I didn't mean that to happen. And what I'd really be saying is, I, I did something wrong. Would you let me off the hook? That's not biblical forgiveness. What God does with forgiveness is he says, you sinned. I'm going to forgive you, not by just saying it's okay, but by taking the sin away. You see, that's where the cross comes in. God's not up in heaven going, oh, okay, you said I'm sorry. Let's pretend it never happened. No, no, no. What God does is God says, oh, you're repenting from your sin. The sin is a part of your life. And so now that you're repenting, I'm going to forgive that sin. So now you're justified as if you'd never sinned. That sin is not a part of your life anymore. And so those who are crucifying Jesus and the Jesus he said, he is, Father, forgive them, for not they know what they're doing. 
Jesus said, Father, forgive them their sins. Take their sins away so that they can be what? Embraced by you. So here you see um, a feami and this little usage of it here. And you can see how the, the New Testament to let go, to leave, to remit, to forgive, um, all of those things come into play with that. And so you can see how kind of that um, Greek words work. And I wanted to show you one more thing that could be really interesting to you. Um, and that's where Jesus said, it is finished. And I want to give you one more idea of a word study that you could do. And so Jesus said, it is finished. So if you look at the Greek text there, John 19, 30, um, it says, he said to, he said that Jesus said, uh, let's speak up, that Jesus, he said, tetelestai. See that word? Let me highlight it for you. Tetelestai. That's one word. And if you look at it, let's see if I can highlight it. I think I can. See that little mill, T-E-L? That's the root of the word tetelestai. And it, we get the English word telescope from that. And it means the end. It means the final destination. It means um, the arriving point. So when you see the word maturity in the Bible, many times it's tied in with the word tell. The word um, teleo is the word I you know, I arrive, I'm, I, I'm there, I'm mature. Sometimes it can be translated that way. But because this is highly inflected, te, tilistai, is a word that means a whole sentence because the inflected nature of it, and it means it has been, it's a past participle, uh, or it's a, it's, a, it's a passive, I'm sorry, getting really tired. It's a passive verb. So it has been, brought to completion. Now think about it. If you were a non-English speaker um, and you saw the words, it is finished, you could possibly arrive at the wrong conclusion. I remember a few years ago, it was popular and it was a wonderful thing. A lot of us had, I didn't have one, but a lot of people had these signs in their front yard around Easter time that said, it is finished. And there was a lot of people that lived in our big subdivision that were probably Hindu and different things. And, and they probably looked at that sign, it is finished. And at first they may have thought, well, what's finished? Because they may not know that Jesus spoke that. If they knew that Jesus said, it is finished, they may have jumped to the conclusion Conclusion that Jesus is saying it's over. Like when you go see a movie, it's finished, right? It's over. But when you look at to tell a style, if you would look up that, that word tell right there, let's see if we can do that really quick. Tell us, that's the noun. Uh, teleo is the verb. Uh, what you would realize is, oh, it's to complete, to fulfill, to, to bring to completion, to bring to perfection, to bring to its desired end, to bring to the end. That's the idea. And so you would say, when Jesus said it had, it was finished, it's very roundabout to say it has been brought to completion. Um, but that's literally what he said. It has been brought to completion. What Jesus is saying is that it's over. I, I'm dying. It's over. Jesus isn't even saying the pain is over. Jesus isn't even saying the mission it's complete. What he's saying is all the promises of God, everything has been brought to completion. Now, is it wrong to say it is finished? No, but just understand there's more to it than just saying it's finished, right? Do you see how doing a word study and going teleos, oh, it's, it's, it, it's not just completing, it's bringing to fulfillment. It's bringing to that end goal. And if we just kind of scroll through this, and we're going to wrap this up here in a minute, it's way past my bedtime. Um, but you can kind of see that we have a lot of different ways of breaking this down. This is the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. And this is the little version. It's actually about a yard, almost a meter wide. If you buy the big one, this is just a little one. So you can get a brief definition of different things. And notice that you have the use of the Septuagint right there, just like we said, the Old Testament in Greek. And here you kind of have a breakdown of some of the, the New Testament variances and usages of the different usage. You have apostolic fathers, those are early church leaders that commented on that word, used that word in different ways. And so here you have kind of this breakdown of the word says. I hope this was helpful. It went a little longer than I expected, but I kind of wanted to give you an idea of what this would look like. Um, just kind of a couple more things for fun, fun, fun. Um, 
John chapter 4. Let's go there real quick. Uh, this does really cool things. So Sychar, uh, somewhere near uh, Jacob's well. We could click on that and say, hey, look it up in a map. I want to see it on a map. Wouldn't that be fun? Um, Atlas map mean the same thing, just different words, right? And so there it is. And so if you're like me, sometimes you forget, where is that place in the Bible? So these, these programs can be very helpful um, by doing things like this and saying, oh, okay. So um, Sychar right here. And if I double click on that, what will happen? Something magical should happen. It's going to open something else that's going to tell me about Sychar, um, show me some pictures of Sychar. And this is where having something like this uh, really goes the extra mile. And if you notice down here, Jacob's Well, which is right near there, I've actually drank out of that well. Well, it's quite good. I don't know if they pump some in there when you're not looking. Um, it's underneath the church. But you can see, um, you could look up this in maps. You can also open a commentary. Some of you have looked at commentaries. One, I'm just going to give you a little bit more. If you want to go, you can go. Um, let's look up commentaries. When students ask me if I'm going to buy one commentary, which one would I buy? In fact, one of the people that I mentored, um, my wife and I mentored them, uh, years ago called me the other day and she's teaching her Bible study fellowship and she said, I need a commentary. And I was like, hmm, this would be the one. Expositor's Bible commentary. If you're if you're kind of a basic Bible student, um, this is something that would give you and you see right here, let's make this go away. Let's go ahead and make our Greek text go away. At least oh, we'll make some of these English texts go away. Um, and then we can actually just take this and put it up here. And you see, as we go through this, it gives us a little bit of commentary. In other words, what, what does this mean? What's going on in this text? And so what's really nice about the Expositor's Bible Commentary is um, you can get it in two little volumes for like 100 bucks or less, very inexpensive. Um, the, the whole 12 volumes is probably three or $400, but still cheaper than a lot of the major commentaries. Um, and you can see that it would give you a whole bunch of great information on John. And so you may you may be thinking, okay, at the end of class, what would be an expensive commentary, um, something that would have more, um, more stuff? Um, and so here you would have one that would have a lot more material. Let me go back and just show you the difference. So like on a basic commentary, and this is more of a pastoral, not really it's not a devotional commentary. It's a, it's a baby academic commentary. But notice on John chapter 4, 4 through 6, we, we kind of cover that much material. If we go to something like, you know, a stout commentary, um, you know, we would know here's 4 through 6. And you're going to notice just in the volume of material would be more. Um, and see four through six and with this one you're going to have a deep dive into Samaritans um, and so you're just going to have more material these will probably throw around the Greek a little bit more but it's all good and helpful and I hope that you've enjoyed the class I know this is almost overwhelming to take a look at this but there's some of you out there that this is the kind of stuff that you really really love and um, if you you're interested in this, this is your chance. Uh, there are a lot of places and times that people are going to unpack this kind of stuff for you, and I know that. I love this stuff, so thank you for sharing my world for a few minutes, and I just challenge you. So if you're interested in, in either one of these Bible programs, uh, Logos, L-O-G-O-S, or Accordance, you can't go wrong with either one. I would almost recommend, if you were to go with one, to probably go with uh, Logos. Um, it's not quite as useful with the languages, but there are more popular books on it. So there's kind of a trade-off. You really can't go wrong with either one. They don't pay me to say that. They should. They should. But um, listen, it's been great being your professor. And I really do appreciate the opportunity to walk with you for a little while. Have a great day, and we'll talk to you soon.